Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. When we have this religious attitude that we think we're so good and we're above other people because we're doing more right than they are. When the Bible really tells us to pray for them and have mercy and sympathy for them and to be concerned for their spiritual well-being. That kind of an attitude alienates us from the Father. And we can't really come into his presence like he wants us to. Let's go to Luke 18 and take a good look at this attitude. This attitude is very deceptive because anybody who has it certainly doesn't want to admit that they have it. But I can tell you that for the first number of years after I got into a real serious walk with God and even a number of years after I was in ministry, I was a first class religious Pharisee. And if that doesn't get broken off of you, If you have that, and I'm not saying you do, but if you don't, you can buy this CD for some other religious person, you know. <laughs> if that doesn't get broken off of us, then God can never use us the way that he wants to. It's yet to be seen what God can do through any one man or woman that would give him all the glory. Now, you listen to what I said. It is yet to be seen in this world what God could do through one man or one woman who would give him all the glory. Because as soon as we start taking the glory, then God has to stop using us and working. It's very difficult for God to find somebody who knows they're nothing without him, but that they can indeed be everything through him. And as I said in the service this morning, and this is really kind of a little bit of a follow-up from what I talked about this morning, Humility is the first attitude that we need to beg God to give us. I've got a little book on humility by Andrew Murray, and I don't think that I fail to read that book at least once almost every year. The first time I read that book, it tore my life up. I had no idea what a stinking, lousy, religious attitude I had. And I began to see that if we have a self-righteous attitude, it causes us to mistreat other people. It causes us to be impatient what, with what we think are their flaws and weaknesses. But we fail to see our own. In particular, I, you know, I do things fast. And back then, I had a very hard time with people who didn't move as fast as I did. And boy, I've had to learn over the years that everybody's not like I am. And what I do well, I can only do it by the grace and the mercy of God. And if God's gifted me to get things fast and move fast and do things fast, it's because he's given me a lot to do, so he's equipped me for what he's called me to do. But everybody else is not the same way. And instead of being harsh and hard on people, how many of you remember last night, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I'm humble, gentle, meek, and lowly. I am not harsh, hard, sharp, and pressing, Jesus said. It's all about that deep inner attitude. Luke 18, verse 9, he also told them this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous, that they were upright and in right standing with God, and yet they scorned and made nothing of all of the rest of men. Now, you know, we are righteous through the blood of Christ, but the knowledge that God has made us right with him as a gift should humble us yet even more. He said this man thought he was righteous in himself and it caused him to look down on and scorn other people. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. One a religious man, the other a sinner. You might say one was the younger brother, the other was the elder brother. And the Pharisee, the religious man, took his stand ostentatiously. <laughs> I looked that word up, and it's like it's an attitude that just gets all over you, even in your posture. It gets in our voice tones. 
Ah, oh, yes, Father. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I can't stand that religious spirit. Makes people act phony and they get a different voice tone when they pray. <laughs> I remember a church I used to go to, and I mean, you know, the woman was sweet. I, but I mean, when she would start to pray, oh, <laughs> holy fall. I mean, it was just like, oh. I mean, I couldn't get in agreement with that because I was too caught up and... My gosh, who are you trying to impress? It's me, Lord. <sighs> I love you. You're wonderful. <laughs> Took his stand ostentatiously. <laughs> Be careful when you get that kind of... And he began to pray, and I love this, verse 11. He took his stand ostentatiously, and he began to pray, thus before and with himself. He wasn't even talking to God. <laughs> he was basically just trying to impress himself. You ever caught yourself praying in a group, and you were caring a whole lot more about how you sounded to everybody else than what you were actually really saying to God? Come on now, am I the only one in the house that's going to admit that I've ever done things like that? And this is what he said. My gosh. God, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of men. Now you think, who would do that? Well, most of us wouldn't say it. But you know, when we hear about something that somebody did and we say, I would never do that. Oh. <laughs> you don't know what you'd do if God leaves you alone long enough. <laughs> Come on. We know what we think we wouldn't do in our present condition with the Spirit of God in our life. But if God just removed his hand for a few minutes, we don't know what we would do. So we shouldn't look at other people when they sin and say, I would never. Can you believe? Have you heard? <laughs> Self-righteous. Attitude. Look, I thank you, God, that I'm not like everybody else. <laughs> I thank you that I'm not like the rest of men, extortioners, robbers, swindlers. See, he was looking at what they were doing wrong which what they were doing wrong wasn't right. But the thing he didn't realize was that his attitude about what they were doing in God's eyes was worse than what they were doing. Is it possible that somebody could be sinning and our self-righteous judgmental attitude toward their sin could actually be worse than what they're doing? I've studied this stuff a lot in my life because I'm the kind of person it's like do it right <laughs> and I'd be very happy to tell you if you're not doing it right <laughs> and I tell you what those scriptures I, I'll tell you a secret those scriptures in Matthew 11 that I read last night take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I'm humble gentle meek and lowly not harsh hard sharp and pressing I actually cut those out and carried them in my purse for years and every time I would start to get that stinking attitude coming up in me again I'd get it out Because I was raised by a harsh, hard, legalistic, rigid man who was judgmental of everybody. And I picked up a lot of bad habits from him, even though I didn't want to be that way. And I'm just begging you today, if there's any of that in you at all, if you're judgmental, if you're critical, if there's any tendency to look at yourself and think that you're better than somebody else. And I know, you know, we don't even like to... 
I mean, you're all going to say, well, yeah, I'm not like that. Well, who do you avoid? Who do you exclude? <laughs> who do you circumvent? How do you treat the poor? How would you act if they bust somebody in here from the inner city and parked them right next to you? Some of you'd be okay, but some of you go. <laughs> what Paul Scanlon had problem was the people in his church actually said, "We don't, we don't want those bus people here." Well, those were the especially wicked sinners that Jesus came for. <laughs> Part of what's wrong with the church now is we sit here all fixed up in our pretty clothes, so full we're about to pop, and we keep the preacher so busy trying to feed us that the guy has no time to go out and minister to anybody that actually needs any help because he's got to pamper us to keep us happy, so we keep coming. Pastor walked right by me and didn't even say anything to me. <laughs> I'm feeling kind of feisty this morning. I hope I don't get in trouble. How many of you agree with me that God just despises that attitude? And you know, <laughs> you know why I'm preaching this message? Because I just read a whole book on it for me. The thing you've got to understand is if you don't stay on top of this kind of stuff, it'll creep in on you. People ask me what I study a lot. I spend a lot of my time just keeping me straight because I have nothing to say to you if I'm going to get up here as a phony trying to tell you a bunch of stuff to do that I'm not doing myself. I read books on humility. I read stuff on forgiveness. I read stuff on the elder son and the younger son, and I want to make sure that I'm not like that elder son who's going to look down my nose at somebody else because I don't think they're just quite in my league. The sad thing is, is it can get on us before we even know it. The Pharisee took his stand ostentationally. I'm glad I'm not like other people, blah, 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 blah. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I gain. I'm in church every time the door opens. I'm an usher. I'm a greeter. I'm in the choir. I sit next to the Osteen. Oh, listen, I've been there, done that. I remember when I thought the greatest thing in the world was to have my name on a parking place at the church because I was part of the staff. Had my name on a seat, the second one from the aisle. Nobody sat in my seat. Nobody parked in my spot. Had my name on the office door, I've arrived, and I was such a pitiful, pathetic mess and I thought that was the important stuff in life. Somebody else thinking that I was important. And I had to go to the pig pen and have a few crises before I said, make me, God, what you want me to be. All this stuff is like nothing but trash. What did the apostle Paul say? I've had it all. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, educated the highest that you could be educated. I was from the best family. I was this, I was that. And he said, I've come to learn that it's all trash. It's all dumb compared to knowing you and the power of your resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while I'm in the body. Let us ask God to give us a humble attitude so we can care about the poor, so we can care about the needy, so we can do more than just come and sing our songs and clap and cheer and go away and not go out in the world and care about anybody. I tell a story about a woman who came to my meetings for 20 some odd years and she said she started praying for me because she really felt I was losing my anointing. Because when she would come, she wasn't fed anymore. She went to God, God, Joyce is not feeding me anymore. I wonder if she has sin in her life. <laughs> and God began to speak to her heart. He said, you're not getting anything because you're so full, there's no place left to put anything. <laughs> and you're not going to get anything else until you start putting out some of what I've put in you. 
The problem is not the preacher. The problem is you're not doing anything with what the preacher's been giving you. No matter how much you like somebody, you just sit and do nothing but listen to them, go home, do nothing, listen to them, go home, do nothing, listen to them, go home, do nothing. Then pretty soon, all of a sudden, you think you need to go somewhere else now because you're not being fed there anymore. So the next time she came to my, my conference, God sent her with a different attitude. He said, I want you to go this year, and you're going to enjoy the teaching, but I want you to go looking for everybody that you can be a blessing to. You take money and be prepared to buy other people books and CDs that can't afford it. You look for everybody you can that looks downtrodden and sad, and you lift them up and give them a word of encouragement. That's the way we need to be. Man, I'm just going to go to work. I'm just going to go to church today and get my blessing. I sure hope pastor's got a word for me. <laughs> Don't need another word till you start doing what the last one said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I so much want to see people grow up, and I know that if we don't get to the root, the root of bad attitudes and bad behavior, that really no matter what God does for you, it'll actually do you more harm than good if things are not right inside. What happens if you have a tree that's heavily laden with fruit but has no deep roots? The first storm that comes along is going to blow it over. We've got to be rooted and grounded in Him and rooted and grounded in His love. Well, the elder brother had an attitude much like the attitude that I used to have. If we begin to look at him in verse... Oh, about back to Luke 11, I mean Luke 15. You guys doing okay with this? So the younger brother comes home and the father right away throws him a party. You know, God likes parties. Do you know that? God likes parties, but religious people don't like parties. <laughs> parties aggravate them. Because they're just not really very happy people. I remember when Dave used to want to play and have fun. And all I was concerned about was the work. I got to do the work. We'd go to the grocery store and he'd be playing with the kids and riding them around the store on the cart. And he was tall so he could see over the aisles. And he'd throw toilet paper or something over the aisle at me and watch me have a fit. <laughs> and I'd just be ready to blow up inside of to use that being married to another kid. <laughs> One day he said, Joyce, for crying out loud, I'm just trying to have a little fun. I said, I did not come here to have fun. <laughs> I am not in this store to have fun. You see this grocery list? The calculator? We got $70 for groceries. I'm trying to keep us from going over our budget. I'm trying to feed these kids. I want to get these groceries, get them in the cart, get them checked out, get them in the car, take them home, put them away. Religious Pharisee. I would act so bad at home behind closed doors, but when I hit the church, praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. fight all the way home and then I'd have a neighbor or something that would get into some sin and I would well <laughs> Lord help us so the elder brother was out in the field and the party was already on the father had killed the fatted calf. He'd given the son the best ring, the best sandals, the best robe. He was so excited that his son had said, Father, I'm a mess. Will you please take me back and just make me? 
Just make me, God, whatever you want. I mean, the party was on. As soon as you say to God, God, make me whatever you want me to be, I'm telling you what, the party's on. The joy is going to come back to your life. As soon as you stop trying to fight God, the joy is going to come back. Well, the elder brother heard the party. He heard the noise and the music from a long way off. And he said to one of his servants, what does that mean? Oh, your younger brother's come back. And your father's so happy because now he's returned. Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's received him back. The elder brother was angry with deep-seated wrath. And he said, I will not go in. Then his father came and began to plead with him, son, please come in. Please come in and rejoice with us. But he said to his father, look, these many years I have served you. Pharisees are good accountants. They know how many times you've sinned and how many times they haven't. They know how many hours a day they pray. They know how many chapters of the Bible they read every day. They probably don't remember any of it, but they know how many. They're good accountants. And if you ever do anything wrong, they can drag up everything else that you ever did wrong. Because they remember it. These many years I've served you, I have never disobeyed your command. And you never did a thing for me. You never did anything for me. Now, what kind of a stupid statement is that? The father said to him, son, everything that I had was yours. You could have had a party anytime you wanted to. You could have had anything you wanted. But see, the problem is when you have that religious pharisaical attitude you can't enjoy anything that God has given you because you're too busy looking down your nose at everybody else I didn't enjoy my life till I learned how to love people I had a big ministry and I wasn't enjoying it because I had not yet really learned how to love and value people it's when you learn to love and value people, when you become happy for the person who's being blessed, when you're glad that God's throwing them a party, when you're glad that God is giving them favor, when you're glad for them. We want to make sure that we're like the younger brother, not like the elder brother. We want to make sure that we're the type of person that says, God, make me what you want me to be. Not the one who says, I'm a little bit better than everybody else. Ask God to take away any kind of religious attitude that you might have and ask him to show you any time you try to get one. Be very careful about judging and criticizing other people and saying, I would never do that. Pray for people that are in sin. Pray for people that are outside of fellowship with God. And always be very, 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 very happy for people when they're blessed. And let me just finish by saying this. Even though the elder brother wouldn't come into the party, God still had the party. And I'm here to tell you today that God's having a party. Whether you want to go or not is up to you. <laughs> Amen. All right. Now, I know that I preached a little bit longer than Joel did, but he told me I could. <laughs> if you've not yet made Jesus the Lord of your life, I, want, I hope you see by this story today that his arms are open wide waiting for you to come back. He's not going to judge you or criticize you. I'm telling you what, the party will be on. God will pour out his very best to you if you just say, God, make me what you want me to be. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, maybe you go to church, but you've never surrendered your life to Christ. You've never been willing to turn away from sin and surrender yourself to Him. Or you're in a backslidden state and you're ready to make a serious commitment to God today. Now let's everybody pray this prayer together. Father God, I love you. Jesus, I believe in you. 
I believe you died for me. I believe you shed your blood for me. I believe you rose from the dead. You're alive now. I want you in my life. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Now I receive you, Jesus, as my Savior and my Lord. And I give myself to you. I give you what I am. I give you what I'm not. Work your attitude in me. Help me think like you think and act like you act. Thank you for loving me and for saving my soul. Amen. You know, there are times when we have a bad attitude and it causes us to mistreat other people. But as we totally surrender to God, we can learn to develop the same compassion, patience, and humility that our Lord and Savior has for us. om te dansen in de zon en te zingen in de regen. Een tijd om uitbundig te lachen en onbekommerd op avontuur te gaan en om je vervelende broertje te plagen. Kind zijn betekent leren, groeien, geloven en dromen. Maar ook nu zijn er op de wereld heel veel kinderen die geen idee hebben van hoe je kindertijd zou moeten zijn. Ze zijn alleen bezig met overleven. Deze kleintjes moeten s'nachts vaak slapen zonder een dak boven hun hoofd. Ze hebben dorst, lijden honger en voelen zich eenzaam. Sommige van hen hebben zichzelf die dag meermalen moeten verkopen... voordat ze hun misbruikte lichaam te rusten kunnen leggen. Helaas is dit niet een verhaaltje over een handvol kinderen in een onzichtbare wereld. Nee, het is een keiharde werkelijkheid. Hier en nu, voor echte kinderen, onze kinderen... Sommigen leven bij jou om de hoek. Anderen hier vele duizenden kilometers vandaan. Maakt die afstand dat een kind minder behoefte heeft aan liefde, bescherming en verzorging? Maak een geslacht, ras of omstandigheden dat een kind minder deel uitmaakt van onze menselijke familie? Nee, toch? Een mens is een mens. Een nood is een nood. En een kind is een kind. Zo kostbaar in Gods ogen. In welke uithoek van de wereld een kind ook om hulp roept... wij moeten er gehoor aan geven. Op welke grond de tranen van een kind ook vallen... wij gaan erheen. We have traveled long.
Gods genade en de hulp van al die mensen wereldwijd die ons hun steun waard vinden, zijn wij in staat om vele hulpbehoevende kinderhanden vast te pakken. Maar er zijn nog veel meer kinderen op de wereld die schreeuwen om hulp. Geeft u daar gehoor aan? Ze zijn op zoek naar een helpende hand. Helpt u ons mee om ze die te bieden?